When our best fur friends leave our world, many of us are left wanting one last scritch, one last hug, one last walk together. One Last Network is a space for pet guardians to honor their pets in their senior years and to cope with the days leading up to and after their passing. Here's your host, Angela Schneider, founder of One Last Network and Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington. Hi, and welcome back to One Last Network. This is episode 27, The Art of Becoming a Couch Potato. There are dogs, Belgian Malinois, German Shepherds, Pointers, Retrievers, who are shipped overseas to work in several different capacities. Many of them are bite trained. They live in kennels, their social interactions limited to what they gain from their handlers. Then they lose their drive to work. They don't get to punch the clock at 65 and say, yo bro, I'm out, I'm going home to get my social security check. They just have to lose their will to do the job. Then they often get discarded, much like a football or hockey player who blows his knee and can't play anymore. Bob Bryant is the Chief Technology Officer at Mission Canine Rescue, an animal welfare group that is dedicated to rescuing, rehabilitating, and rehoming these working dogs. Today. Bob and I have a lively discussion about helping these dogs, how quickly they're willing to become couch potatoes, and why you might want to adopt one of these dogs. Have a listen. Hello and welcome Bob Bryant to One Last Network. I want to congratulate you on being the first male voice to hit our podcast. All right. I don't know what to say. <laughs> should I uh, should I put on a bulletproof vest? <laughs> No, we're pretty easy going around here. Um, why don't we get started with you telling us a little bit about Mission K9 and who you are? Sure, be glad to. Um, my name is Bob Bryan, as you've obviously ascertained already from the eloquent introduction I received. My official title, which is not worth a quarter, is Chief Technology Officer and Development Director. That means that I'm the guy that's stuck and responsible for making sure everybody gets paid and that the organization fulfills its mission to as many dogs as possible, which we're doing at a 92% spend toward our mission. Uh, just eight cents out of every dollar goes to something other than the dogs. Uh, mission K9 uh, brings working dogs of all types uh, home from around the globe predominantly military working dogs that have retired and need trips home to their handlers. The government doesn't automatically just bring a dog home at the end of its career. And often if its handler wants to adopt, uh, could have up to five handlers during its service, uh, they would have to be responsible for the cost of transport uh, from abroad. And from a place like Japan, that's $6,000. Guam, it's around $7,000. No corporal has that kind of money. Uh, we can get more into that in a minute. But uh, we also rescue contract working dogs, which often assist our military or private companies. And they are owned by private firms, not by the government. We also work with uh, the TSA, with some of their airport dogs, uh, and also Customs, border protection, uh, customs and Border Protection as well as a lot of police canines when they retire. We center our work on these things. We rescue dogs. We've rescued over 1,300 from every corner of the world in the last 10 years. Uh, we've reunited over 650 of those dogs with handlers that they served with. We will rehome any working dog that is suitable for adoption and we find families that are able to meet the needs of senior dogs as well as bring that dog into their house. We will rehabilitate dogs to the best of our ability uh, medically. We will get them as close to, if not 100% if possible. We will do training to mitigate uh, the effects of PTSD on dogs that have been in combat and other traumatic situations. And we also repair these dogs. Any vet care they need, they get it. These dogs have trained like professional athletes all their life. And uh, we try to ready them 
to where they can be adopted and not stick their adopters with massive veterinary bills. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of what we do. These are generally dogs of certain breeds, I would imagine. Right. Let's go over the big list. Yeah. The most predominant working dog in the world now, due to its size and speed and weight, is the Belgian Malinois. Uh, they're lighter, faster, less prone to joint issues than German Shepherds, and they actually have a higher bike strength. Plus, they're crazy. <laughs> so that, that's part of it. I've owned one. I've owned one. My God, help me. The dog will eat the house if you didn't keep him entertained. Um, second is the good old German Shepherd. I have a retired canine named Navy that's a bicolor German Shepherd. They're big dogs. Uh, they're pretty healthy. And then we'll have a lot of Labrador Retrievers. And then we see German short-haired Pointers and Springer Spaniels used by TSA. Why do you think TSA uses them and not German Shepherds or Mouse. Well, those are nose dogs, right? They they work on scent, so they're looking well, for well. They're all good. They're all good nose dogs. But why, in particular, a, a Springer Spaniel or a German Short-haired Pointer? Hmm. Here's why. I won't. I, I won't make you. I won't make you think any longer. It's because <laughs> they're not scary looking. Of course. German Shepherd, people are like, well, you know, let me away from that dog. Or Malinois, like, my God, get me away from that dog. But no, uh, they're just, they're benign. One of the smallest working dogs is Jack Russell Terrier. Where do you think a Jack Russell Terrier would work and be very effective in a military uh, environment? I would think, again, nose work, but those, they can be intense little bugs. Yeah, correct. Yes, but where would they do that nose work? Drugs? No, no, no. Where would they do it? Oh. Location. This is a good one. You have to think about it. What's got a lot of passages and nooks and crannies? Oh, my gosh. I'm drawing it. We, we all live in a yellow. Submarines. Really? There you go. Yes. Really? How's that? Yes, when, the Jack, when the Jack Russell comes on board, sailors get nervous. Why? They're looking for their weed. <laughs> If they happen to bring, if they happen to bring any on board, which of course we know they don't. Right. <laughs> Do these dogs age out, or are there other conditions that force them into retirement? Unfortunately, it would. Well, not unfortunately, it would delight me if they age them out. I would like to see dogs aged out by nine years old. Unfortunately, what happens is the dogs are only retired when they lose their work drive or when there are lingering, costly veterinary issues. That's when we see them retired. I've seen a military working dog that was still active, retired at 13. Wow. The dog lives six months. You know, it just uh, they need some time to know something other than you know, that life. Now, I'm no dog psychologist. I'm not going to pretend that I can tell you what a dog is thinking, but I bet some dogs would like not to work every day for 13 years. I would think so too. You get tired of that shit. Yes, ma'am. You do. Sometimes a dog just needs to be a dog. These dogs, as you alluded to earlier, they're often discarded by the military or the organizations, much like a football player who blows his knee. Were it not for an organization like Mission Canine, what happens to these dogs? Well, with the military, let's let's take them out of the potential evildoers category. Uh, they treat their dogs with rare exceptions. I've never seen a military dog that came to us with anything less than a medical jacket this thick, with it, with all the information, all their vaccination records, everything that have ever been done to that dog. And even though they are maybe kind of a little more at the end waiting to be transported to wherever, they have the best of care. So the mil let's leave them out of the equation. My problem with the military is they don't always bring the dog home at their expense. Mm -hmm. They're starting to more and more, but right now we're trying to get uh, one dog to Korea 
and then bring two military dogs back from Korea. My partner's about at her wit's end. She can't find any airline that's willing to transport those dogs. Wow. And the military is not going to do it on their own. So that's my gripe with the government is the lack of support uh, for them. Once we get these dogs stateside, we handle it. We take them wherever they need to go. Now, contract working dogs are the one that I could paste into the colors of suffering. When contract working dogs are retired or even more frequently, when a contractor has financial instability, the dogs are the first to suffer. They won't get fed properly. They won't get any of that care. They'll be stuck inside a nasty, filthy kennel for days on end. They don't get stimulated. They often don't get light. And we've seen dogs that should weigh 70 pounds come back weighing 38 pounds oh, no. from contractors. Now, are all contractors bad? Absolutely not. Uh, however, I wish that people would petition the government to demand and require contractors taking United States-based canine assets abroad to have a ticket home for them and set funds that are used for their care to where they can't screw over the dogs. Do they get turned over to rescues or shelters or do they get turned out onto the street and just forgotten or all the things? No, most of the time they're just stuck in the contractor's kennels. Uh, they're, they occasionally will adopt them to foreign nationals, but most likely they reach out to an organization like ours and uh, they will, they'll come to us and say, hey, we've got seven dogs. Uh, they're over in Iraq. Can you take them? And of course, we're going to take them. So we raise the funds. We get them home. Our, my partners arrange for all the transport. And it's a, it's an overall positive situation. And we try to address any needs they have when they get in. We just brought home 14 working dogs from Turkey. Every one of those dogs had heartworms. Oh. 22, actually, no, it's $2,800 a pop for heartworm treatments. Wow. Yeah. We spend, we probably spend, out of a $2 million budget, we probably spend close to 700000 a year on vet care. Wow. How do you do your fundraising? Predominantly through our social media network. Uh, Facebook is the main driver. We have 117,000 very engaged fans. And you know the fact that we've been around 10 years, we've received some private funding as well through various grants, trusts, foundations. Uh, we've had people leave us in their will. It's always it's not always easy, though, when you run an organization that has as high a spend toward our mission, meaning that out of every dollar, 92 cents goes to the work. We are often too much nonprofit. And I've struggled at the end of a month or two in 2022, wondering, you know, how the kennel guys are going to get paid, you know, how are we going to get there? And people always respond. But uh we don't send any begging emails or anything like that. We just paint the picture for what it is. You know, we need this. Here's what it's going to take. If it doesn't happen, the dogs aren't coming home. Will you help? Yes, no, or kiss my grits. And they always say yes. What is the stigma that these dogs face when you get them back stateside and looking for adoptive families? Uh, no stigma in particular. Let me tell you the bitter reality of it. I would say that 90% of working dogs that come back don't like other dogs. I know my, I know my canine doesn't. He'll kill an off-leash dog that runs up on him. And I have to keep my head on swivels in parks that are supposed to be leashed dogs. There's always some, you know, person there that doesn't have their dog on a leash. And I have a nice uh, little air horn that saves the day. Navy doesn't like it. Another dog doesn't like it. And then I will scream at an owner, get your dog on a leash. And then normally I'm accused of having a dangerous dog. And why would I do that? Right. And so anyway, now I think I just skipped over your question and uh, had brain loss and didn't answer what you asked me. <laughs> That's fine. The stigma that the dogs face. Stigma. Yes, yeah, stigma. The biggest problem is they're not dog friendly. Right. And, and the majority of people 
that want to adopt have a house full of pets. They love animals. And so we have to go through often 30 adopters to find one that is qualified to adopt the second biggest problem and a precursor or precluder to adoption is that they've got to have the money to provide veterinary care as needed for senior dogs. I mean, get a senior panel every year. I don't, we don't want to hear, I'm sorry, we can't afford to take you to that boy. You know, right. we want them to have the best of care. And we also don't want them, you know, don't adopt a Belgian Malinois when you tell me that you're going to be away from home eight hours a day. That's not going to work. So just we have to find the right homes for these dogs. And, and occasionally we have too many in our care. We have that going on at this time. And we just we're trying to ramp up our adoption efforts. But with, that's without shortcutting any requirements. It, it can be hard enough for a senior dog to be adopted, but there is a whole different level with these senior dogs who have to be rehabilitated to, for lack of a better term, civilian life. Right. How do you rehabilitate those dogs to prepare them for the couch? Simple. <laughs> when they come to our ranch, which is in Magnolia, Texas, we call it the veteran canine ranch, uh, where we have the dogs in our care there, they are rotated through our ranch house where they learn to be a dog, sleep on the couch, do their business outside, because generally when we get them, they're not uh, trained at all for that. Then they get ready to go, they just go, you know, so we teach them where to do that. We try to address uh, and test them to see if they are dog aggressive, to see if they're cat aggressive, to see what their triggers are. Uh, what things are liable to make them aggress if they're bike-trained dogs. And that's another big issue we have is with dogs that are trained for protection, and there is a great need for them. There's some people here in the United States that want to see the end of police canines because bad dogs bite people. Well, maybe don't run. Maybe don't break the law. You know, you want less than lethal. That's less than lethal. I'm sorry the dog bit you. I've been bitten. It's no fun. But that's just it. Um, we try to see what their nature is, if they're going to bite. How, uh, adopters wanting dogs, retired dogs, to protect them. Right. I'm not going to ask a 10-year-old Belgian Malinois to protect me. He is physically and mentally older than I am. It's just like asking grandpa to go out and fight the bully at school. Mm. You don't want to do that. So uh, it's adopters having unreasonable expectations of what these dogs will do for them. Also, uh, and for anybody listening, our dogs cannot be certified as service dogs. Their work is over. There is an indemnity clause signed when you adopt that agrees to all of this. And they, the National Service Dogs organizations are given lists of our dogs, and they will know if somebody tries to adopt one, I mean, to certify one, and they will report it back to us. So how long does it take for a Mal or a German Shepherd to go from military working dog to couch potato? Oh, as much as a week to about three or four months. <laughs> some of them just some of them are already couch potatoes they don't care yeah you know one of them got retired because he kept lying down halfway through his walks he was just done he was done yeah that's right and they know better than we do a lot of the times don't they i, I would think so that's correct have you always been a dog lover i've always had dogs yes have I always been a dog lover? I would say that until I got into this back in 2011, that I did not have the appreciation of dogs that I cared for. And I have some deep regrets about earlier pets, about them being quote unquote outside dogs, you know, not being part of the family or feeling put upon when I was forced to go walk them. You know, I realized through doing this, just what these dogs are capable of. So, you know, now I've had I've had several, and all uh, 
two military working dogs, uh, one uh, uh, contract dog named Anubis, a big Belgian Malinois, and then uh, Canine Navy, who we picked up uh, three years ago. He was retired early from the city of Longueuil, Canada. And in Canada, unfortunately, when a bike trained dog is retired, uh, they can be euthanized if they don't have a partner to go to, and he didn't. So they reached out to me, and well, here he is. <laughs> is it ideal for the working dog to be rehomed to one of the original handlers? If it's possible, that's absolutely awesome, assuming that handler is capable of providing for its needs. Because once, you know, we uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the funds to provide ongoing care and support for the dog once adopted. I wish we did. You know, in a perfect world, well, in a perfect world, they'd retire them at nine years old and provide them vet care for life and get them homes themselves that are a fit. But that's why we're here. They don't do it. Right. It's It's got to be difficult on the handler as well to end up being separated from that dog. In most cases, yes, that's correct. It's, it's that is true. A human animal bond and there has to be a different level to it when you're working with the dog in that capacity as well, yes? I find that very true with American handlers, uh, handlers from the United States. I don't find that as true with foreign nationals handling dogs, say, in uh, North Africa, Iraq, Kuwait, uh, Iran, Indonesia, Singapore, Serbia, mm -hmm. South Sudan. Uh, there is a general disrespect for animals. Uh, Anubis, our Malinois, came to us from um, Iraq, and he was beaten by his handler because he wouldn't release his toy. That's how much he liked it, and so the only way to get it is to either choke him out or beat him. So they beat him as a result. He was absolutely terrified when he came to the United States and, and just stood and soiled himself in his crate when he saw the porters come to take him out. And uh, they called up. We had just lost our working dog, Nora. And they said, we've got this dog. Will you take him? And, of course, my wife said she would. And uh, he bonded to her like a tick. Uh, he didn't, I would say, honestly, he never, I don't think he ever really liked me. He tolerated me, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, he loved her and he would, he absolutely drove her crazy because he did not want to be two inches from her wow. at any time. That's beautiful though. Mm -hmm. It was. With her on that level. How long have you been with Mission Canine now? We've been in existence uh, since 2000. Well, right at uh, 13 years. I'm mean, sorry. Yeah, 10 years today. So has it been life changing for you? Uh, it's been life changing in what I see that I'm able to do for a cause that I've found that I care deeply about. I've learned how to speak to the people. I've learned how to get them to open their, their hearts and their wallets and to help us to provide the best care for our dogs. Now, I have to give Kristen Maurer, our president, and uh, my co-founder, Louisa Kastner, who serves as our vice president, they're the ones that are physically doing all the work. Kristen, especially, Louisa manages the ranch dogs or veterinary programs. Kristen hauls these dogs all over the country in vans. She flies them to Kuwait, to Korea, to Spain. She doesn't get near enough sleep, and she has to hear me gripe about it constantly. Uh, she will stress herself to the point of exhaustion. She's about to go nuts right now trying to get these dogs to and from Korea. It's making her insane. All this while she's on vacation. Has your mission become more difficult since the COVID pandemic? Because a lot of airlines have changed their rules. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, it's been It's not been difficult in terms of fundraising. We've actually had an increase in that. However, it's a nightmare. Plus, uh, the Centers of Disease Control, the CDC, didn't do us any favors when last summer they put the rabies ban from all the hot countries. And so we had to find some creative ways to get some dogs back home, and we did it. That's awesome. What are some of the biggest things you've learned from the dogs you've worked with or brought home? 
Really? They are some of the they are some of the most intelligent animals I've ever had the opportunity to work with. They are intuitive. They are crazily driven to find whatever it is that they're looking for. My shepherd now is a uh, drug dog, and he has found heroin for me. He's found fentanyl. He's found. I keep a Narcan kit with me because you never know. Although our 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 organization is based and operates under Texas laws. I travel between Texas, excuse me, Texas and Thousand Oaks, California. And out here, you never know what you're gonna find. Uh, it's a very still conservative area, but there's some drug activity. And there's not a week that goes by that he doesn't hit on something. And I find a crack pipe or a, some marijuana in a bag or something like that. If you were to convince someone why they should open their home up to one of these dogs, what would you say? They will experience one of the smartest animals they've ever had in their life. That dog will bond with them. It will become a part of them if they will open their mind and heart to it. And how do our listeners help Mission Canine? If you want to adopt visit our website, that's mission, the letter K, the number nine, the word rescue, mission canine rescue dot org. If you want to uh, see what we're doing currently, take a look at some of our reunions. Uh, Facebook is mission K9. We're also on that uh, on Instagram under that same name. And you can donate through the website or through Facebook. There's a number of ways. And as I mentioned, again, 92% of every dollar goes right to the work. There is no wasted funds whatsoever. And no amount is too small, hey? No, I've gotten, smallest donation I got, I got a, I got a kid sent me 85 cents, seriously. Oh. Said, please get a dog home. A quarter, and I forget like however many dimes to make up 85 cents. I still just, I sent him a nice thank you note and what have you. You know, we've seen we've seen donations anywhere from normally from five bucks to, you know, who knows what. We appreciate whatever someone is able to give without any hardship. Uh, I've had I've had welfare recipients call me and say, I've got this much. Leave me to the end of the month. I'm going to give you this much money. I'm like, no, you're not going to do it. I won't take somebody's twenty five dollars if they're telling me that's the last twenty five dollars. Their heart is too big, in some cases. Bob, but is, I still make I still make them feel good though, because <laughs> I know they want to do the right thing. Of course, you do. Is there anything you'd like to share that we haven't covered? I think you've just about hit it all. You've done well. Uh, we love what we do. We would love for everybody to get the chance to have a retired military working dog. I guess if I have to say anything else, it would be this, and that's and it's that's an adopter beware. These dogs don't have your normal lifespan of a dog you get from a puppy. And because of that, you're going to say goodbye way too soon. You may get five years, you may get three years, you might get a year. You just never know because lots of things lurking that even the vets we have check out don't see. But uh, just be prepared and be able to handle the loss. But know that that three years will be as good as 10 with another dog that's not to the level of these dogs. Beautiful. It's a wonderful way to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time, Bob. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. Since 2013, Mission Canine Rescue has helped working dogs find a comfortable, peaceful retirement. I think you know by now that I believe every dog deserves the love of a good human, and these retired working dogs in particular have given their lives to service. They deserve all the scritches, snuggles, and bacon. Of course, bacon. If you're interested in helping, whether by adopting or donating to the cause, check the links in the show notes for all the contact information for Mission Canine Rescue. Next week, I have a chat with my friend and mentor, Nicole Begley. She is the top dog at Hair of the Dog Academy, an online portal designed to help pet photographers like me run efficient, profitable businesses. But that isn't what we're talking about. Nicole recently faced a sudden onset illness with her beloved pup, Zoe. We talk about that, a lifetime of accumulated grief from a career in animal husbandry, 
and the healing journey she's on. I'm Angela Schneider, owner of Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington, and your host at One Last Network, signing off to go get some Bella Snuggles. Listen to One Last Network on whichever podcast platform you prefer. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you have a friend who might be interested in our content, make sure you share us with them. Thanks for listening.